Okay, to set up this conversation, the Nerdland crew dug up an NBC News report that you have to hear to believe. Let's take a look back at the dawn of the modern women's liberation movement, but also at some misconceptions that came along with it. This clip covers the 1968 protest outside the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The women's liberation movement organized several groups to protest the Miss America pageant as a symbol of society's exploitation of women as sex objects. It's a popular protest. The groups proliferate. They exist as cells, brigades, associations. There are names as colorful as red stockings and bread and roses, as explicit as new feminists, women for women, older women's liberation. They are addicted to acronyms, WOLF, for Women's Liberation Front, RAP, for Women's Radical Action Project. There are groups who hate men and marriage and think all babies should be born out of test tubes. Hating men, having babies in test tubes? This is actually not what the Women's Liberation Movement was all about. And contrary to popular belief, it did not include bra burning. The myth of bra burning, however, actually spawned from this very 1968 event. A New York Post story, written by a woman, by the way, about the protest, figuratively referred to bra burning as a way to draw a parallel with Vietnam War protesters burning draft cards. You see, the media picked up on the bra burning label, missed the Vietnam connection, and the mythical act of feminist rage became synonymous with the movement. Outside of the Miss America pageant, women did throw bras and girdles and mops and pans and Playboy magazines into a large gab garbage can. And according to Carol Hanisch, one of the organizers of the protest, they had intended to burn them, but because they were on the boardwalk, the police wouldn't actually allow them to play with fire, at least not literally. That was then this is now and what's next. Joining me to talk about the challenges facing the next generation of women, Emily Carpenter from girlsforgenderequity.org. She's 17. Leslie Cardona, who is president of her school's organization, Young Women Creating Change. She's 18. And Julie Zeiling, Zeilinger, I'm sorry, an undergrad at Barnard College and author of the book, A Little Effed Up. Why feminism is not a dirty word. She's 19. Ladies, I am thrilled to have you here. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having us. Hey, thanks, for, thanks for coming to Nerdland. So you just saw that video, 1968, Women's Lib. Is there anything about what we just saw that resonates for you that feels like, oh yes, I'm part of that long experience? Or does that feel like that was a million years ago? I think it's still very relevant today. And the thing that's interesting about that clip and that myth, in fact, is it just goes to show there are so many misconceptions about feminism and the women's movement at large out there. I see it every day in my own life amongst my peers. They have these really negative stereotypes and connotations with the word when, in fact, it means so much more. And that's what I try to prove every day on my blog, The F-Bomb and in this book. Right, so your blog is The F-Bomb. You've got the, a little effed up book. I mean, you're, so you're actually trying to intervene in this conversation about the idea that somehow feminism is gone for young women. W would either of you actually call yourselves feminists? Is it a label that you take on for yourselves? Or is it one that is not as relevant? Well, I feel like it's something that I do take on. And I, at first, I wasn't sure. I was like, I'm all about race, and feminism is like a completely different thing. Yep. And as I started to learn more about what was going on and how I felt as a woman, I realized that saying that I am a feminist is so important because it really bridges bridges the gap between women of different generations. It It transcends race. It transcends everything, you know what I'm saying? And I just feel like identifying as a feminist is is really important um when it comes to connecting with other young girls. Right, and it doesn't mean that you have to give up having a real concern about racial equality and racial justice right. as well, right? Those things can go together and, and often do. How about you? Do you, um, uh, uh, Leslie, do you take on feminism as a label for yourself? I do not. I just believe that I'm a true advocate for women. I don't think mm -hmm. I need to identify myself with that term, you know, to just to be a supportive of women. Right. And so when you think about sort of being supportive of women, what are the big challenges that you see women of your age, 17, 18, 19 years old? What are the issues hmm. facing you? I definitely feel that education is an issue, um, like about, you know, graduating and things like that. A lot of people think when we graduate high school, it's over. It's like not an expectation for us to go on to college and things like that. That's why I like my school where they hold the higher expectation of all of us. We all go to 
um, four year colleges and we all graduate. It's not it's not over after you graduate and it's and it's not okay to drop out and things like that. Feel but free to give schools, your school a shout out. You can name check it if you like. <laughs> Capital Preparatory Magnet School. <laughs> Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I believe that that high expectation of us is what makes us go farther. If a school just expects us to graduate and that's it, that's what we'll do. So, so speaking of high expectations, I mean, in certain ways, this is the best time to be a young woman. There's, there's never been a time when more young women have gone to college or had opportunities for equality. And yet it also feels like a time when there's a lot of new restrictions um, emerging for young women. Are, are, are the three of you tuned into the idea of the war on women? Is it something that you've been listening to, thinking about? Yeah, I think that the war on women, it's actually a really interesting to time to watch our generation because I think a lot of young women are having this political awakening watching what's happened. I think a lot of young women thought that our rights were won for us in the 70s and that's a big reason why they might not identify as a feminist. But now I think a lot of young women are starting to realize those rights could go away at any point, that there are politicians every day trying to take them away from us. And I think that it's lending to a lot of young women finding their voices and realizing that they have to stand up for what they believe in. Yeah, we were looking at a study by the Guttmarker Institute showing that um, in in the year 2011, the number of uh, policies that were enacted for abortion restrictions, and so you can just sort of see from that graph that basically throughout the 80s and 90s, it's sort of, you know, a, a fairly low number, and then suddenly it becomes a very high number very recently. So when you look at something like that, does that feel like something that makes you feel concerned, or do you think those aren't the fundamental issues facing young women right now? Um, well, I feel like it it is something that makes me feel concerned, um, and especially because I feel like oftentimes, like I was watching Democracy Now!, and there were, there were all these men in a meeting, and there was not one woman present, and I feel like that's, that's a big issue, and that's what we need to be talking about, having women being part of the conversation, having young girls being part of the conversation, and I feel like, unfortunately, that's, that's happening, but not enough, and not on a national scale, so I feel like it's important for for women to be present, and that I think they're trying to be, but it's important that we that we are. Yeah. So, so obviously, you all weren't of age to vote in the last election, right. but in the last election, obviously, Hillary Clinton was um, running in the primaries, and then Sarah Palin was on the vice presidential ticket. Do you imagine that you'll see a woman president in your lifetime? I, I believe in hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I was I was watching a documentary, and it said that at age seven, the same amount of boys and girls want to be president. But by the time they're 15, that number drops. Like one third of those girls still want to be president. And the amount of boys that still want to be president, that wanted to be president at seven still want to be. And I feel like there's, it goes back to education. Something's happening where the girls think that they can't be president. So I feel like that's important. I love that you watch Democracy Now! <laughs> and documentaries. This is completely fantastic. Do you think it makes a difference? I mean, if, if we have a woman president, yes. would it make a difference? How, or rather, how would it make a difference to, to be a young woman and see a woman president? I think that visibility is so important. You know, a lot of people have said you can't look up to a role model that doesn't exist. And role models mean so much to young women. But going off of what you said also, I think that there's this huge societal imposition on young women that we constantly feel like we're being judged. I think that comes from a number of sources, like unattainable beauty standards in the media is just one. And we're so afraid of putting our voices out there that the idea of leadership terrifies us, whether we're qualified or not. And I think that's also a huge obstacle for us. You know, it's interesting that you talk about this, this image, and you were talking about how your school says, you know, that it's going to create for you the expectations of going to college. What do you see as how your school has been effective in creating an expectation for women in leadership? I believe that with that expectation, it made us do, you know, the things, they even prepare us for everything. They are the true, like, core to why we do the things we do. And without it, you know, we, if we didn't have that, that expectation, we wouldn't go on. And now, you know, with YWCC, I learned, like, there's, there's a such thing as woman centers, and now I'm like, oh, when I go to college, I can be part of this woman center, and, but I wouldn't have known that if I didn't go to this school. Right, so it kind of gives you a place to, to gather that information. Yes. When we come back, I want to talk about Julia. Julia is this video that came out from the, um, from the Democratic Party to talk about sort of how young women like you would be impacted by the policies of today. And I'm interested in whether or not you see yourself in Julia. So when we come back, that's what we will talk about. And also, what makes this year a game changer for women? So don't go away.
Welcome back. We have been talking with young women, three young women who I'm completely falling in love with over the commercial break. Um, and this week, my fellow nation writer, Jessica Valenti, declared this the year of the young woman. Jessica writes in the column, quote, while the media was saying feminism was dead and our foremothers were complaining that young women were politically apathetic, we were preparing for these very fights. But bringing down Rush Limbaugh and getting a transvaginal ultrasound mandate removed from state legislation is not the same as game-changing policy. We need institutional power and backing to do that. Maybe now is the moment we can actually have it. Joining us once again to continue our conversation about the year of the young woman are Emily Carpenter, Leslie Cardona, and Julie Zeilinger. And joining us also is Salome Shatillet of the University of Pennsylvania. So I said just before the break that I wanted to talk a little bit about the Julia video. And Julia is kind of the, uh, it was an early strategy by the Democratic Party, the Obama administration and re-election campaign to say this young woman, Julia, would be um, impacted at all these different life moments. Um, by, you know, Obama administration policies, you know, positively. First she'd have Head Start and then she'd have student loan, you know, debt forgiveness and all of that sort of thing, all the way up until she would retire with a good, strong Social Security. Do you all see yourselves in Julia? Like the, the, the idea that a young woman is kind of carrying the policy campaign for the president, does that feel like, oh yeah, I'm like Julia? Or do you think, what in the world does that have to do with me? Hmm. I think that in some sort we are kind of all like Julia and the education programs that he is trying to implement are very important and I feel like the way that you know the it's the life of Julia how it helps her throughout her whole entire life even with the student loans like who wants to be in debt when they're 40 for undergrad like you know and it's like we need someone that is going to support us throughout our whole life. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think even on a strategic level from the campaign to really go to young women and young men where they are, which is online, using social media and giving us a tool like that to educate our peers who might not really be thinking about those issues and yet it directly affects them. I think that's great, especially considering that I think there are about 64 million eligible voters from our generation in this next election. And it's so important to reach out to us and allow us to have a tool to reach out to our peers as well. Yeah, I mean, everybody's asking what your what your age group is going to do this time. You know, 18 to 25 year olds were incredibly important to the president last time. So, do you see yourself in Julia, Emily? Um, you know, I feel like I feel like I do. Just for the fact, like, growing the way that they at 17, where where you are, and as far as school and things like that. I I would be interested though mm -hmm. to have something of maybe a group like a. A YouTube video or something, girls responding to it because it's very important to be like, oh, is this? Yes, this is what the Obama administration thinks young women are going through, and I feel like it would be great to also have young women responding to that from all over the country, so they can say, hmm, is this right? And they can adjust the life of Julia to see how real young girls are responding. Uh, so. Listen up, Obama campaign. If you're <laughs> listening in Chicago, we're going to need you to have some actual young women speaking back to Julia. So, Amisha, I actually want to go to you because, speaking of Chicago, yeah. you actually run a program with young women. And, you know, I was, um, I'm so engaged with these young women's voices, but I know that part of what you all are doing with A Long Walk Home is trying to make sure that there are institutionally safe spaces as well as sort of empowerment for young women. And Jessica was leading us to that in that Nation article. How do we combine both sort of their voices and the policy and institutional changes young women need? I think Jessica's article is really good because one of the things she pointed out too was uh, you know women of color, young women of color, actually being at the forefront of the reproductive justice movement today. Yep. Um, and so with the Long Walk Home, the population of young women that we work with are primarily African American and Latino women, um, ages you know from ninth grade to to going into college. And so we're really excited through our Girlfriends uh, Institute to continue to do that work. But what we've noticed is if you actually engage youth, and I think this speaks to the point that you you were making, if you engage young women and actually have their voices and experiences as central to policy you actually it's a really great organizing tool because through our work with um, different schools in Chicago uh, public schools in Chicago North Lawndale Charter Prep for example you get parents involved you get teachers involved and you get community members involved so if you start with the girls themselves the ripple effect is tremendous and so usually policies are top down right right right, right. the Julia ad like you said but if you actually have a collection of girls speaking truth to speaking truth to their experience then what kind of ripple effect will that have? And I think adults actually have a very difficult time handing over that power or sharing yeah. the power with young people. <laughs> yeah, like I say, all, all the good-hearted adults I know say, 
I want to go and speak to the young people, and, and very few say, I'd like to go and listen to young people, right, to actually hear that, which is part of why I love the idea, Julie, that you wrote a book, um, because there's no better way to have a voice than to, than to put it out there. Talk to me a little bit about both your blog and this book. What are the motivations for you? Yeah, the real reason I started my blog with the F-bomb, which is what this book is based on, is because I felt that we really needed a space to say what we had to say about the feminist movement, about our experience as young women in general. I didn't find spaces like that online. I was looking for them. I had a lot to say, so I decided to create one. And every single day, young women go on, and they have so much to say, and I think people should really listen to them. But the reason I also decided to create this book was to give them a tool as well, because I think a lot of young women just aren't educated about these issues. They aren't exposed to them. I certainly wasn't in high school. I wish I had been. I came to it in a different way. And I think education, as you were saying before, is really the key to getting to these issues and to allow women to know that they can use their voices. So use your voices in the, in the, in the remaining uh, moments that we have here. If you had five minutes with President Obama and five minutes with Mitt Romney, or maybe just 30 seconds with each of them, what would be the one thing that you would either say to them or ask them? I would say it's truly about women empowerment. Who is going to do the most to, not just even women, just men as well, citizens, who's going to, you know, make this economy better, give everyone jobs, and who's going to be that tool that will help us throughout our whole life? Because we're the ones voting for you. Yes, right. <laughs> right. Um, I would also say, wow. This is intense. If I had 30 seconds. Okay. I would say, for one, I feel like it's important for young women to know that their voices are important. Like, I feel like that just needs to be stressed so much because I feel like for a while I didn't even know that my voice was important and needed to be heard. And I feel like it might be hard for President Obama or Mitt Romney to make sure women's voices are heard because they're men. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So I feel like it's important for them to to have women close to them, women advisors, female advisors, um, to make sure that young women are being heard and that they know that their voices are super, super important. Fantastic. Julie, what, what would be your 30 seconds with the president or Mitt Romney? Yeah, I think I would just say, listen to us. We know where we are. We know what our experiences are. You know, there was a recent survey that showed 88% of us support comprehensive sex education. Give us comprehensive sex education. We know right. what we need. Thank you all for joining me. Emily Carpenter, Leslie Cardona, and Julie Zeilinger. Salamisha, stick around. Coming up.